Last week we ended with a uh, little bit of a tricky passage that uh, I wanted to kind of pick up where we left off there in John chapter 2. Um, as it turns out, we were kind of talking about those who believed. And you might think, well, good for them, but in this case, not so much. Uh, we saw there at the end of John chapter 2, it says there that many of those people believed, verse 23 of chapter 2, in his name when, he, uh, when they saw the miracles which he, had, uh, which he did. And as we kind of mentioned last week, I always say miracles never really produce real faith. And one might argue, well, Brett, here these people believe because of miracles. But that's where the rest of this kind of comes into play, where Jesus, um, Jesus uh, verse 23, uh, they saw the miracles, verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And you remember that word for Jesus believing or committing is the same as the people believing. The same Greek word is that Greek word pistuo uh, that we looked at last week. And we'll look at it again because it's going to come into play uh, this evening as well. Uh, to think to be true, to be persuaded of, to credit, to place confidence in. Why would Jesus not pistuo them, uh, but they pistuoed him? Uh, the, the answer is because it wasn't a real um, true faith that was leaning completely on Christ and all of his claims. They just believed some of the stuff because of the miracles which he did. So he did not commit himself or pistuo to think to be true their faith because he knew all men. Um, so that's kind of where we landed. But, but Jesus is going to jump on that idea of this uh, pistuo. We'll see that in chapter 3. And chapter 3 is very fundamental in Christianity uh, the, probably the most famous verse in all the Bible is right here before us tonight. Uh, and, it's, it's, and you kind of start to see the gravity of the moment and what's going on here. So, um, you know, some of you might think, well, if Jesus did a great miracle, I would believe in my life, I would believe. Uh, don't be so quick to believe that. Um, I believe the Lord has done miracles for us in our lifetime uh, just uh, even the creation speaks of his glory, the miraculous creation around us. And uh, it's amazing how even creation doesn't, um, you know, um, doesn't make people kind of wonder about, well, God must exist. By the way, uh, um, just a quick reminder, we're all still here from the big eclipse that was supposed to happen, bring all the uh, rapture and everything. I, I never said that. Uh, I kind of told the opposite of that. But, um, there, you know, if, if there's one thing that I, I find really interesting about the, the eclipse and what have you, um, and that is simply that, isn't it interesting that the moon is at the exact distance to cover the sun, you know, either a lunar eclipse or solar eclipse are all kind of interesting to me because the size of the moon and the distance from earth to the moon to, and then to the sun is so perfect that it perfectly blocks out the sun. Uh, that's, is that just a coincidence? See, scientists have to say, oh, what a coincidence. Now, if you saw the, the uh, lunar eclipses from Mars, for example, um, the Mars has a couple of moons that eclipse and they've got our, our, uh, one of our you know, little satellites that have been traveling with cameras and stuff, took pictures of the, of the eclipses of Mars. But those, those moons don't match up perfectly. They're just little spots going across the surface of Mars on a shadow. But, um, but what's even more interesting is that our moon is, is, is perfectly facing, we don't see the backside of the moon. Like as the, as the moon goes around the earth, we don't see the backside of the moon. Of course, some people believe that's where the space aliens are. Um, and they're back there just kind of watching earth from behind a kind of a curtain there, like the Wizard of Oz. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but the backside of the moon uh, is interestingly, we, we don't see that because the moon stays facing us the whole time. And not only that, you know, just the distance of the earth to the moon, how did, how did the moon ever come to be? Did it just fly through space from some explosion in space and, and our earth kind of captured it uh, with our gravity? But with such perfection, it, it maintains the earth's and the moon's distance uh, fairly well. Um, and, you know, the whole billions and billions of years thing that evolution requires, uh, the distances of the sun to the earth and the earth to the moon would not have allowed for life on earth if it took billions of years or even hundreds of millions of years. Um, like there's all kinds of things evolution doesn't really bring any solution to the table. 
Um, but as it turns out, when I see things like, you know, the solar eclipses or lunar eclipses or, or the various things in space, it just to me speaks of God's glory and his creation and his um, d intelligent design that he had when he created all things. Um, so kind of important all that. But Romans 1.20 says, for the invisible things hid from creation, it even says, of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. That's us. Um, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Who's the they there? Humanity. Humanity is without excuse because of creation. It speaks of his glory, uh, shouts of God, but people still don't believe. So just this whole thing of believing because of miracles, it doesn't always produce faith. faith. Question, where does true faith come from? The word of God, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So this, uh, this idea of believing, pistuo, uh, it's gonna be coming up in the chapter as we continue. The difference between shallow belief versus leaning on something as if your life depends on it. Um, uh, this, is, this is important. Uh, have you ever had your, your belief in something that you know is true, but your belief ever tested, uh, where you were required to kind of uh, decide um, you know, do I really believe this? I, I love the story of a high school science class. Um, and there was a, a report that was, you know, where a kid had to demonstrate something in the class. And the class had been learning the law of the pendulum, you know, about energy and speed. And, and you know, that a pendulum, the, the swinging back and forth eventually decreases. Uh, it's just a, a you know, a, a physical law. Well, this uh, student set up a little thing in the classroom. Uh, uh, kind of a string with a big bowling ball on the end of it, or kind of a light rope, and kind of fastened it to the center of the room, and then swung the bowling ball uh, and, uh, and, and was able to show that when he pushed the bowling ball to the wall, and when he would let it go, the ball would swing across the, the, the room and then swing back, but it would be just, it, the, the energy would decrease by just so much it only missed the wall by a half of an inch the next time it swung, you know, across the room. And, and so th then the student said, how many of you believe in the law of the pendulum? You know, and they're all like, yeah, that's awesome, you know. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then he had the teacher, uh, he said, teacher, I'd like to have you for a demonstration. And he sat the teacher with his face and head up against the wall and put the ball on his nose. And then he said, okay, teacher, do you believe in the law of the pendulum? And the teacher said, y -y 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 yes. And he said, okay, here we go. And he let the ball go and the ball swung across and the teacher saw the ball coming back and he shrieked like a little girl and jumped out of the way. And the student said, he doesn't really believe in the law of the pendulum. <laughs> belief, do you really believe it? As if your life depends on it. Um, you know, it's kind of an interesting uh, dilemma for a lot of people. Uh, but believing in Jesus, as we're going to see in John chapter 3, is the whole thing. The whole um, is a huge chapter. Trivial pursuit for you Bible nerds, uh, which I'm in that category probably. Um, uh, the one thousandth chapter of the Bible is John chapter 3. I think that's fun uh, information. It's a big chapter. Just remember the one thousandth chapter. Um, and so we have a, a, a story here that's uh, someone who's truly seeking God. And he comes in the form of a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. Uh, and uh, we're gonna see uh, him asking some good questions uh, for the right reasons, I believe, um, actually to learn. Um, have you ever noticed there's people that love to raise questions for other reasons? Um, on the internet, for you that get all tangled up in the biblical discussions on your Instagram or, uh, you know, the chats and various uh, places you can talk to people, um, man, try to be a better, uh, I think the church is, is, you know, there's a lot of trolls that just love to get people upset and try to throw in questions and stuff that are not really legit, uh, you know, and they're, you know, they say, well, there's no such thing as a dumb question. I totally disagree. A lot of dumb questions. And the dumb question is those that love to just, you know, cause confusion and stir up trouble um, and to raise further questions in your mind. And oftentimes the people that raise those kinds of questions wanna just hear themselves answer your question. They're already thinking about their answer before they actually really wanna know uh, the truth. Um, so Jesus was asked all the questions by the other religious leaders and their motivation, as we've seen in previous gospels, uh, was, you know, ill-tempered. Uh, Ill you know, they came to trick Jesus, to trap Jesus. But you get a definite sense from Nicodemus that he's got more of a sincere heart 
uh, and we'll see the fruit of that here, uh, starting in verse one. John chapter three, verse one. There it says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Um, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now, right here in the first couple of verses, there's a lot we uh, learn about um, Nicodemus. Others use the same exact greeting. Um, and um, we know uh, that thou art a teacher come from God. Like um, he's basically saying rabbi or master. Those are the words you hear that people use all the time, master or rabbi. Um, Nicodemus is sort of putting Jesus in that category. Now, this is interesting because Nicodemus um, probably at this point thinks he's kind of on the similar level maybe as Jesus, as calling him a rabbi or teacher, or, you know, you're a, you're a teacher come from God. Um, that's almost like we're bros, man. Like we can hang because we're the same. Uh, but one thing I love about uh, our savior, Jesus, uh, you don't have to be in the room very long before you realize you're not in the same category. You can be the CEO and the lead of a giant corporation. You can be the wealthiest celebrity in the world. You can be the most powerful leader of a, of a country, um, but in, in light of Jesus Christ, you're just a tiny person who doesn't know anything about anything. Uh, Jesus is the one who is, is the greatest. And, and Nicodemus is gonna start to be uh, closer to understanding, wow, who, who is this guy? Um, the others didn't really believe Jesus came from God, but Nicodemus does, it seems. Um, there's, there's some things we know about Nicodemus a little bit from the Bible, but also we learn some stuff from extra biblical uh, history, uh, which is kind of interesting just to know who Nicodemus was. Um, the, the, the name Nicodemus comes from two words. The etymology uh, is two other Greek words. Um, the, the first one is uh, Nick, the Nike comes from, does anybody know what Nike means? You guys are from Portland, hello, <laughs> Nike? Victory, correct, victory. Uh, yeah, Nike, uh, interesting word. Uh, speaking of that word, uh, when we go on our Paul's missionary journey trip this summer, uh, we're gonna go through Ephesus. Uh, here, I'll show you just a little sneak preview of some of our, uh, in, in, in Turkey. Um, it's, it's quite a trip, but um, we go to Kusadasi, our ship kind of ports there, and we get to go through one of the biggest, most incredible ar ar archeological digs in, in all the Middle East. It really is an amazing, Ephesus is incredible. Um, this is, these are some buildings that were there during the time of Paul the Apostle. That amphitheater is where Paul started a riot uh, with the silversmiths and all that. Um, these are some of the homes that they dug up in Ephesus. The reason I'm showing you this tonight is because one of the pictures that's still on the wall of, of, of this person's home is Nike, the goddess Nike. Um, that's who they worshiped in Ephesus, one of the many gods along with Diana and others. But this is sort of the the goddess of the Greeks, uh, they called Nike, which was the goddess of victory. Um, and they worshiped that God. So um, the, the, that, that's partially probably where, where Nicodemus, his name uh, is kind of interesting, especially being a Jewish rabbi or teacher, uh, Pharisee, um, uh, you know, and the word Damus uh, in the Greek. Uh, so you put those two words together. You got Nike, which is victory, and De uh, De Damus, uh, it means the people or the mass of the people, um, or uh, even a, a mass of people assembled in a public place. That's kind of what a, de or crowd is what we would say. Um, so Nicodemus, um, the, many people believe his name means conqueror or victory over the people. Uh, uh, or even ruler of the people, which is interesting because in our verse one, it says Nicodemus was um, a ruler of the Jews, verse, verse one there. Um, maybe they gave his name uh, after he became one of the rulers of the Jews because that's what his name really sort of indicates, a ruler of the people or commander, chief, leader is sort of the idea there. Now, we know that this is interesting because when you, um, when you take a hard look at Nicodemus's name and what it means, he was probably not just your average, um, you know, Pharisee, but actually he, he was uh, quite the leader. Um, he was the, uh, the ruler, one of the rulers that was part of the Sanhedrin. Now I told you that they never had more than uh, 6,000 uh, Pharisees in Israel at any, in any given time, no more than 6,000, that was the rule. But the Sanhedrin was a, a group of 70 members 
uh, who were responsible for uh, religious decisions, also um, under the Roman Empire for civil rule, civil rule. Um, two Sanhedrin members that are noteworthy um, who appear in a favorable light in the Bible. There's two Sanhedrin members, um, uh, maybe two and a half, depending on your perspective. Um, uh, one uh, favorable is uh, Nicodemus. Does anybody remember the name of another favorable Sam, Sanhedrin member? Yes, yeah, somebody said it. Joseph of Arimathea. He was also a member of the Sanhedrin. And we see him and Nick at the tomb. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea gives his tomb to Jesus, or I'm going to say loans, loans, uh, just for the weekend. Um, a little Airbnb tomb uh, for Jesus there. Nic Nicodemus is the one who brought the herbs and spices uh, to Jesus' tomb along with Joseph of Arimathea, which is kind of cool. Um, so we, we call those the two good guys. You might also call another guy that was part of the Sanhedrin that's, that might have been a good guy, but it's sort of mixed as Gamaliel. And uh, you remember there was an interesting dissertation that Gamaliel went through um, when it came to some important topics, but that's debatable whether he was like a good guy or a bad guy, in my opinion. The Talmud writers, um, as it turns out, uh, the, the Talmud re uh, records... Um, you know, more about the, the ruler nature of what Nicodemus would do. Um, sort of the, 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 word, the word ruler means, uh, the Greek word for ruler, as it says there in verse one, the ruler of the Jews is archon, which is a ruler, commander, chief, or leader. So he's a um, part of the Sanhedrin, a ruler. The Talmud writes um, about the connection with Nicodemus um, uh, as a guy named Nicodemus Ben-Gurion, which is kind of an interesting Jewish name. Maybe you've flown into Israel to the Ben-Gurion uh, airport. That was a different guy, um, uh, David Ben-Gurion. But, uh, but some say that was Nicodemus's full name, Nicodemus, according to the Jewish Encyclopedia. The Jewish Encyclopedia in 1905 uh, talks about Nicodemus as the one Sanhedrin member that was converted to Christianity. And they weren't real happy about that, to say the least. But, um, but it also tells us uh, interesting that Nicodemus was um, one of the four richest men in Jerusalem, according to the Talmud, um, which is kind of interesting. It goes along with him and him and Joseph of Arimathea hanging out. They were both wealthy guys, um, probably because they were part of the Sanhedrin. Um, but he was labeled uh, sort of maliciously one of those disciples of Christ, of Jesus Christ. Um, Hoskins writes that Nicodemus' son, this is outside of the Bible, this is just may or may not be true because it's not the Bible, but it is interesting, extra biblical literature. Uh, Hoskins writes, Nicodemus' son negotiated the terms of surrender before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So that's, that's an interesting possibility. Um, but um, uh, all that to say, although Joseph of Arimathea is mentioned in all four of the gospels, Nicodemus is only mentioned in the Gospel of John, which is kind of interesting. It makes you wonder if John was more acquainted somehow with Nicodemus, um, which would make sense. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at nighttime, uh, and we'll go over maybe the reasons why nighttime was important, but, but, um, but maybe this is where, you know, John was the closest disciple to Jesus. Um, maybe this is how John knew Nicodemus in more of a personal way, even as Jesus is meeting with Nick at night. Uh, right here. Uh, but um, all that to say, uh, he was a Pharisee. Um, he um, is, uh, their hope of, of being somebody in, in their lifetime would be who they were related to and their lineage, their pedigree. Pharisees would walk around talking about their endless genealogies of who they were related to. Remember, Paul the Apostle warned Timothy, don't be given to those guys that give those endless genealogies. But that's, that's the pedigree sort of of Nicodemus. He, he was somebody because of his lineage. Um, um, and, and um, you know, they would, they would show up and talk about who they were related to, Moses or Elijah or whatever. But Nicodemus comes to Jesus, Mr. Reputation, Mr. Powerful, and he's gonna stand before this guy from Nazareth, a uh, carpenter, uh, you know, itinerant rabbi. Um, and it's kind of gonna be interesting to see uh, how he approaches Jesus. Um, so why did Nicodemus uh, come uh, at night? It says there, verse two, the same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God. Um, now, a lot of times they would say this sarcastically. We don't get a sense that Nicodemus is saying this sarcastically. He, I think he truly thinks he's a rabbi, a teacher, uh, and he's from God uh, because of the miracles and all that. Um, but 
Um, but why did Nicodemus come at night? Some suggest that Nicodemus came because he shouldn't be shown talking to Jesus meaningfully. Like the idea of having a real conversation with Jesus as a Pharisee member could have gotten him in trouble perhaps. Some have suggested that. I'm not sure about that one. The second um, reason is perhaps Nicodemus being scholarly, being somewhat famous in a crowd. Like if he was walking around Jerusalem, the, the, the Sanhedrin guys were like celebrities. Um, the, the uh, you know, Pazzarazzi, pa, what do you call it, Pazzarazzi? Yeah, 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 paparazzi. Uh, those guys would be around taking uh, shots, you know, and oh, there's, there's a ruler, Nicodemus. Uh, and it wasn't really conducive. Maybe Nicodemus came to Jesus by night when the crowds were gone and he could have a meaningful conversation. Um, Jesus was also popular. Uh, so maybe it was to bypass the, the multitudes and have a meaningful discussion. So um, the Bible doesn't tell us though why he went at night, but it is interesting to speculate. Um, so the other times we see Nicodemus, he's not a major Bible character, but we see him uh, actually coming to kind of a subtle defense of Jesus when Jesus was on trial before the priest. Um, Nicodemus in John 7, uh, verses 50 through 51, um, kind of said, you know, doesn't our law not allow us to judge a man without a fair trial? We're supposed to hear him uh, and give him a fair trial. And he was suggesting that they hadn't get, given Jesus a fair trial. Um, at the burial of Jesus, like I mentioned in John 19, verses 39 through 40, that's where we see Nicodemus coming with Joseph of Arimathea uh, with the spices, which by the way, linen clothes and the spices that they had for Jesus were very expensive. Um, and so that came from Nicodemus, who uh, um, perhaps um, was, was buying all that stuff along with Joseph of Arimathea. So you gotta love Nicodemus, even though he's not a major Bible character, he, he, we're gonna kind of see how he comes around here in chapter three. One of the things you should also note that you might miss in the English translation, um, and that is that there, Nicodemus might represent a small group, um, sort of a plural faction of the Sanhedrin that didn't hate Jesus. There may have been some of the Sanhedrin that, that were actually believers in Jesus, including Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, and there may have been more. And the reason I say that is because in English, like where King James particularly, where like, um, uh, you know, in verse, in verse two, um, you know, he says, um, we know. Who's the we there? It uh, seems that Nicodemus is talking about more than one. He, he, he could have said, I know you're a teacher from God. But he says, we know you're a teacher. I wonder if there were more. You know, um, there's other places where you wouldn't see it, like verse seven. Marvel not, Jesus said that I said unto you, you must be born again. Um, the you there is, is more of a plural in the original Greek language. There, in fact, for you Greek people that like to get into some of that, the verses of interest are verse two, verse seven, Verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12, all uh, are more of a plural when it comes to we, the Sanhedrin, parts of the Sanhedrin. So that's kind of an interesting thing. I wonder how many of the Sanhedrin actually weren't hating Jesus. It seems that Nicodemus was kind of left out of the, he, they kind of recognized he was not uh, a hater of Jesus. So he seemed to be kind of left out of some of the trial proceedings and stuff like that. Um, so we always think, you and I probably always think of the Sanhedrin as a whole. Um, uh, they were horrible people and they just wanted to kill Jesus. There's a chance that there's a portion of them that didn't. And the evidence is Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and there might've been a few more. Well, verse three, Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus just goes right out of the gate, going right to this, the, the key issue. Uh, not, you know, what does the Torah say about this or that, or, you know, have some big debate. And can I just uh, remind us, when, you're, when you are, you know, talking on the internet and chatting and uh, arguing with people, forget all the big arguments. Go right to the thing Jesus went to. You must be born again. That's the real issue. I think we waste a lot of time, you know, pontificating about things we don't even really know about or are at least difficult to debate or talk about when really Jesus just zeroes right in, hey, Nick, you gotta be born again. 
Um, and, uh, and this is a huge, huge thing that Jesus brings up. Um, we, we, we started talking about that on Sunday, the key doctrine of Christian faith. Um, and it was one of the musts of chapter three. We saw number one, the must of the sinner. Uh, that was on Sunday and uh, Saturday, we talked about that. But this idea of being born again is, is a key doctrine of the Christian faith. Um, except a man be born again, verse three, uh, he cannot see the kingdom of God. One of the things that I um, didn't really talk about uh, along those lines on Sunday is the nature of um, this, of this uh, declaration. When Jesus says, you must be born again, this puts us in what I would call one of the essential doctrines of the Christian faith. Um, when we're going through John, John touches on um, the essential doctrines. What, what's what's the, an essential doctrine? Um, boy, we could get into a long discussion here. There's the essential doctrines. Some would argue there's secondary essential doctrines. Um, and how would I define that? The secondary defense, uh, essential doctrine is one that is still an essential doctrine, but a person may or may not have to fully understand it or believe it and, and yet still be saved. Um, but the essential doctrines are pretty uh, important for us to say, what are they? Now, what are not essential doctrines? Um, just because we call something a non-essential doctrine doesn't mean it's not important. Does that make sense? Uh, so like, for example, y'all know that I believe strongly uh, the way the Bible tells the last days and the eschatology, the way it's gonna come out. I feel strongly about uh, one of many opinions about how the end times are gonna unfold. Um, and that's not an essential doctrine. You can be a preterist if you want to. You can be wrong. Uh, um, but guess what? When you're raptured uh, and taken up to heaven, you're going to change your notes on the way up. And you'll say, oh, Pastor Brett was right uh, about that. Um, <laughs> uh, what's interesting is thinking the other way around. If a pre preterism is true, when's that gonna, when am I going to realize I was wrong? Think about that. But anyway, that's a whole other discussion. Uh, I digress. So, you know, um, there's some essential doctrines, non -es uh, there's secondary essentials, and then there's the non-essentials. Um, I'm gonna sort of identify those as we go through the Gospel of John. But one of those essential doctrines is that you must be born again. Jesus um, all but says, that's an essential doctrine when he says you must be born again. And you would also uh, conclude that by verse three, where uh, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Um, so to be born again uh, means to be born from above. Um, you know, uh, uh, that's another meaning, by the way, born again, uh, to have a spiritual transformation that takes, takes a person out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. Uh, that definition, by the way, comes from the Bible knowledge commentary, um, which is an, an, a great commentary. I like that one. Uh, but it's a good definition of what it means to be born again. Uh, and then, you know, Billy Graham, he, he said, a born again Christian is someone who has repented of their sins, turned to Christ for their salvation, and as a result has become part of God's family forever. Um, I like that definition too. Billy was right on that one for sure. Um, so, um, I do like the word born again, the phrase born again, because it's pretty definitive. If you're saying, are you born again? I think you have to kind of know what we're talking about. The, the term Christian, are you a Christian? That's more clumsy. Um, and I'll tell you why it's a clumsy word. Uh, it's clumsy. You say, I like the word Christian. That's okay. If you like it and you want to use it, great. But there's a lot of people around the world that call themselves Christians that are not born again. You see the problem? Um, you know, we could talk about, uh, you know, by the way, the word Christian, uh, it's, it's uh, Christianos, uh, the Greek word, um, which means follower of Christ, but also belong, belonging to Christ. Um, there's, there's, there's some people that go around saying that um, it meant little Christ. And I've said that from things I've read from uh, other sources and stuff, but I've yet to really find the absolute source of people call, calling them little Christ. Um, but for sure it means belonging to Christ. And there's some uh, writings outside of the Bible that meant belonging as like slaves. Um, and maybe that came from Paul's later saying, I am a doulos of Jesus Christ, a bond slave. And so the belonging to Christ is part of the Greek connotation of this uh, Christianos. Followers of Jesus, they were first referred to as Christians, um, by the way, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And if you remember, that was the, um, the Gentiles of uh, Syrian Antioch um, that called them Christians. And it wasn't meant to be a nice thing. It was meant to be an insult. Uh, we know that Acts 11, 26. Um, so it says the, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, um, which is interesting. Before 
they were known as Christians, um, there were different words that were thrown around the Bible that you should know about. Um, one of the, the terms, an early term of what a Christian was is they were called the brethren. Acts 15, one, 1 Corinthians 16, 20, they're called the brethren. Uh, uh, another term that's very common that should make sense to us is disciples. Anybody who was a disciple was a follower of Jesus, Acts eleven twenty six. And then um, another one that is confusing because some people will only ascribe the word saint biblically to the Jews, uh, God's elect and what have you, but uh, the saints are also uh, Christians that were called that in Acts chapter nine, verse 13. And uh, you say, well, who are the saints? Very special people that the Catholic church has sort of dubbed as a saint. Um, listen, you're either a saint or you're an ain't. Um, the whole sainthood thing of Catholicism is not biblical. Uh, if you're a, a born again Christian, you are declared a saint in the Bible. Um, that's Acts 9.13 and other places as well. Um, there's another phrase, uh, that, uh, or it, it could be a two word or four word phrase, um, it's called the way or the people of the way used by Paul the apostle. Even before he was converted, he called them uh, these people of this way, Acts 9, 40, uh, 9 chapter two, uh, and also of that way, Acts 19, nine, Acts 24, 22. So that's kind of a cool one too. I like that the early church called themselves the way. Um, and by the way, the, the symbol of the early church was not a cross. But if there is any symbol they used uh, regularly, it was that of what, anybody know? The anchor, which I love that one too. You should get an anchor on your, you know, tattoo it on your arm there to say mom or whatever. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I don't know. Uh, no, anchor is a great symbol. Uh, and and uh, that's kind of cool because they, that, that's where they found their anchor is in Christ Jesus. Um, so the word Christian, especially when you travel around the world, I've, I've been to a lot of countries and, you know, some people call, you know, Americans are Christians. All Americans are Christians. That's the way they view us. Um, um, you know, which is not true. Mormons call themselves Christians, but they, they believe in a different Christ than that of, of um, the New Testament Bible. The uh, Christian scientists, uh, what an interesting thing. They're neither Christians nor are they scientists. Um, I think we have to be careful with the idea of a Christian nationalist. Um, there's a lot of people, God bless America, uh, and they've got sort of this idea of Christian nationalism, but I'm not sure uh, all of that. There, there's, there's some people that are patriotic and love our country, and, but a Christian, Christian nationalism can mean any number of things uh, today. That's a, another clumsy term uh, that we have to be careful with. But, um, but if you're a person who believes you're, you're a patriotic American, which makes you kind of a God-fearing person, uh, the question I would just ask you simply, have you been born again? Because you can sing God bless America till you're blue in the face, but that does not make you a Christian. So the, the idea of born again is such a key uh, topic here. And it's, I think it's one that we need to bring back and use because it's so definitive. And you say, well, what does it mean? I'm still a little, um, a little uh, unclear on this idea of being born again. Well, Jesus is gonna answer cerebral Nicodemus. And uh, it's a pretty deep thing that Jesus is about to say. Let's pick it up in verse four. So of course, Jesus said, you're, you know, you gotta be born again. So verse four, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit. Now that, that answer, did that bring a lot of clarity for you? <laughs> I, I think most Christians kind of go, huh, what? Born of water and the spirit. And, and there's, there's uh, this gets kind of graphic. Of course, you know, uh, uh, you know, Nicodemus is like, uh, what are you talking about? Going back into your mother's womb? Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously he's, he realizes that's kind of ridiculous and that's not what Jesus meant. Um, but the definition, uh, you know, basically verses five through eight is given of what it means to be born again. And some people make this a controversial passage because of the one word, water. 
Uh, what does water have to do with being born of, of uh, born again? Um, and there's there's several um, sort of definitions or possibilities when people try to you know rightly divide the word and teach this. And I'm going to say these are I'm going to give you five of the big ones, five big possibilities. Some I don't agree with, um, but I'm going to throw them out there anyway, uh, just to have food for thought. Uh, and then I'll tell you which ones I kind of tend to lean toward as far as what this means. Um, I think we can all conclude um, that it, it does mean to be saved, to be a Christian, to go to heaven. You got to be born again. But the, the language here is a little tricky. So uh, let's go through. Uh, born of the water and born of the spirit. What, is, what in the world does that mean? Um, well, let's give you the possibility. Possibility number one. Uh, some suggest that the water refers to n the natural physical birth and the spirit is the birth from above. Um, uh, this could be a possible, when Jesus said, you must be born of water and of the spirit, you will not be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. So, so being born of the water you know, uh, is like, <laughs> not to be too graphic, but when a, a pregnant woman's water breaks, it's the baby's coming. Um, by the way, I had a perfect record going for a long time. There was uh, a lot, lot of, you know, at Athey Greek, we have a lot of babies uh, that cranked out here. It's a baby factory here at Athey Greek. Um, but there was a season back years ago at the school when we were particularly as young and everybody was having babies, but these, these, um, these moms would be like just a little overdue and they say, oh, you know, and the husband and the wife would come up and say, hey, would you pray for us? You know, we're, we're two weeks overdue. And, uh, and so I'd pray. And then uh, I, had, I had two instances on the very same, one happened right there, her water broke as we were praying. I was like, you know, it's like, <laughs> Yeah, just ask old Pastor Brett. I'm pretty much a spiritual Pitocin. Uh, 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 but uh, but uh, uh, and then another lady, we prayed with her and her husband and then on their way, the water broke and they, they ran to the um, uh, hospital and it was great. Um, and I had a, a, a track record of that and then I kind of lost my touch somehow. I, I, I prayed and uh, didn't work after that. So uh, <laughs> I'm sort of joking on that one. But uh, the idea is, um, you know, to be once born physically and one spiritually. Now, I think that's possibly true. Uh, uh, and it, it is true, even if you erase all the, all the, 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 the scripture we just read here, um, this, this is still true. In order to be born and see the kingdom of God, first you have to be born in the flesh, um, and then you have to be born of the spirit. We do know that's true. Now, whether that's what Jesus is talking about here, that's where the debate uh, comes in. So that's possibility number one. That's probably the simplest uh, possibility. Possibility number two, the word water refers to the word of God. Now, that's not without merit. I'm just gonna say, I'm not sure there's enough evidence that supports this one. Um, however, this one will tie in with another possibility a little bit later. Um, but the tie-ins there, of course, is Ephesians 5, 26, that Christ washes his bride in the water of the word. And so, and then, you know, there's a bunch of scriptures. Now you're clean by the word that I've spoken to you. But it's a pretty loose connection, the word of God referring to this being born of water. Um, that, so that, that one's, I'm not a big fan of possibility number two. Uh, possibility number three, the, the, the water refers to baptism as an essential part of regeneration or being born again. Um, now, this one is one that I wanna warn you about. I, I don't agree with this one. This view contradicts other Bible verses. That's the problem with this one. And this is why, this, this will help us kind of exercise how, how to rightly divide the word of truth. This is, a, it's important to read your Bibles carefully. And if you come up with a scripture that does seem to go against other scriptures, then we're probably understanding that wrongly. Um, there's a lot of people that will say, yep, this is Jesus saying you gotta be baptized and you gotta be um, born in the spirit. So uh, you're born of water, baptism, and born of the spirit. Um, this contradicts uh, salvation by faith alone, um, which is an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. If you add baptism to the list of things you gotta do to be saved, suddenly that's a work of the flesh. You going down to the river, being baptized is a work of the flesh. And there's scriptures like John 3, 16, that don't support that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, that whosoever believeth and is baptized, it doesn't say that. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 talks about how you're saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift from God, not of your works, lest any man should boast. I was baptized. Um, no, we can't say that. Um, so some take this and say, you're not saved unless you're baptized. There's other problems. You have the thief on the cross 
who we know he was saved because Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He was saved. But Jesus didn't say, hold everything. Let's get off the cross. You gotta be baptized if you really wanna be saved. And so Jesus baptized him and then get back up on the cross. Okay, look, now we can die. You know, like he didn't, he didn't do that. He, it's because baptism is, is, is not an essential uh, thing to be saved. Um, I will say, however, this is important. Baptism is essential to a Christian walk with Jesus Christ. Um, baptism is something we're told to do. Repent and be baptized. It's, it's a for sure thing we should do out of obedience. It's, it's a get to, by the way, I believe. When you get baptized, it's life changing and power giving. And it's just a beautiful expression of what God has done for you personally and practically. Um, by the way, uh, you know, it's funny, all these churches that are really hardcore and yeah, you gotta be baptized. Um, I've noticed nobody ever gets baptized at those churches. Meanwhile, uh, this coming, uh, April 20th is our next baptism. We already have over 50 people signed up for that baptism. Um, and then we have 20 people signed up for May baptism. In June, we start doing them almost weekly, like, because there's so many, it's, you know, the river gets a little warmer, so it's, uh, but the chosen frozen, they're gonna be going for it uh, April 20th. Uh, 50 people already signed up for that one. Um, we love all the people getting, we got hundreds and hundreds of people being baptized. Uh, and it's just so cool to see that. Um, by the way, if you're interested in being baptized, uh, just go to athecreek.com. You can find out when and where our baptisms are. We, we go old school. Uh, we find the nearest river location that works and we'll baptize as many people as we can in the river. Um, I, I love that. Um, so I'm not against baptism, but I'm just gonna say, I don't agree with possibility number three. You'll hear this a lot from certain circles that baptism is essential to be saved. Um, I, I disagree with that. Um, Number four, now we're getting to some uh, more of the heavy duty, uh, deeper stuff, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. Uh, number four, the water refers to the repentance ministry of John the Baptist. And the spirit refers to the application by the Holy Spirit of Christ to an individual. So this, this, this is basically saying John the Baptist was preparing everybody, just like you and I have to prepare people. If you wanna share the gospel with some, someone, first you have to convince them of their sin, and then they have to get to a place of repentance. Uh, repentance is an important thing. Unless you repent, um, now, now remember, repentance is not something that saves you, um, but it's what gets you to the place where you realize your need for salvation. So repentance is really important um, and you, you must repent. Repent and be baptized. I think it's interesting those two are often car carried together, interestingly enough. So John the Baptist was preparing the way for Jesus by, by saying, y'all sinners and you need a savior. And so if they were baptized in John's baptism, it was a baptism of repentance. Remember, we went over that a few weeks ago. Um, after Jesus would die on the cross for the sins of the world, baptism was a sign of being born again, crucified with Christ, being come up a new creature uh, and, uh, and our sins being buried with Christ. Uh, it's a beautiful picture of salvation and regeneration. That's what our baptism is. John the Baptist baptism, but the Bible differentiates the two. So some would say that Jesus is referring here to the water of repentance of John the Baptist. Um, this fourth view, by the way, has merit um, and um, of, of historical propriety as well as theological acceptability. Like uh, there's some that really uh, stand on this one and argue this one. Um, John the Baptist stirred the, the nation um, with his message of repentance. Um, water uh, would remind Nicodemus of the Baptist's emphasis on, on repentance. So could it be that Jesus was saying to uh, Nic Nicodemus, in order to enter the kingdom, you need to turn to him, repent, uh, in order to be regenerated, born again by the Holy Spirit. Um, so uh, that, that might be a possibility. I'm not gonna uh, deny that one. Uh, that's, a good, that's a good one. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Number five, and this is the one that I probably lean on the most. Uh, number four is good, but number five is, as I go through the Bible and see kind of context and all that, I kind of think the water is simply a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason that sounds so simple, uh, you say, well, Brett, yeah, that, that, that's kind of a no duh, but it may be a little harder to explain and understand than just that. And let me, let me kind of try to attempt that. One of the things we've noted in, in the Gospel of John is his parallel with Genesis. Have we seen that so far? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1. Uh, 
Uh, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And, and we've seen parallels from Genesis already through the gospel of John that's kind of an interesting. Um, in fact, would you flip back to Genesis 1, 1? And I'm gonna take you in a little bit of a circuitous route here, but uh, try to hang with me. Uh, there's an end in view, hopefully. Genesis 1, 1, turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Boy, these first two verses are full of all kinds of interesting things. Uh, I love Genesis chapter one, verse one and two, uh, and really the whole thing. I uh, can't wait to get to Genesis. Just in a few weeks, we'll be there. Uh, uh, yeah, it says here in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the, earth, uh, of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, um, there's something here that's, that's so cool, and the word was is, is really interesting. Um, the Hebrew word for was, uh, in this case, is uh, this, this word uh, that uh, means, literally, it's, it's uh, hayah, like karate chop, hayah. Um, <laughs> it means to be, become, or come to pass. Now, this is interesting because you know, some translators would say maybe a better translation would be in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth became, um, uh, or it came to pass, uh, which, which implies something that, that's, that's, that's interesting. So it says in the earth, verse two, the earth became without form and void. What made the earth become without form and void? Boy, there's a loaded question. I'm not, I don't have time to go into it. If you're interested, just go back to our teaching from Genesis 1.1. It was only uh, 10 years ago or so. Um, but uh, there's all kinds of theories of what happened between Genesis 1.1 and 1.2, um, which is kind of interesting. The earth became. But on the topic of creation here, notice a couple other things. Verse 11, uh, it says in verse 11, um, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding uh, fruit after his kind. Um, keep that in mind, after his kind. Look at verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass and the herb yielding seed after his kind. Um, uh, also uh, verse uh, 21, just fast forward there. Um, God created great whales and every living creature that uh, moveth, which... Uh, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. What, what brought it forth? The waters and every winged fowl and every, uh, after his kind. Um, you see, we, we, this, this idea of after their kind um, is, is, keep this in mind as we go back to the gospel of John, when, when, when we go back there, just, just in a minute. But the idea is the earth was without form and void. Some would argue that's a picture of death. Um, uh, before creation, um, um, you know, what happened? The earth became without form and void. So what happened between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2? Something. But it, uh, a lot of scholars say the earth was without form and void is a picture of death. But verse 2 of this chapter, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, it says there. What brought things to life? The Spirit of God moving uh, upon the face of the waters brought forth life. And the rest of that, we start seeing... Um, you know, creation and life being brought in by God's beautiful creation. Okay, are you guys with me so far on that one? Uh, keep all that stuff in mind. Now let's flip back to John chapter three. What did Jesus say to John uh, here, or to Nicodemus, I should say, verse five? Jesus said in verse five, except a man be born of water and of spirit. Um, is that reminiscent of Genesis 1-2? It kind of is. As the earth was, you know, if we're following the pattern of Genesis 1 1 and John 1 1 and the beginning, um, it's reminiscent. The, the, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Uh, look at verse 6. It says in verse 6, and that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Does that sort of ring a bell in the sense that flesh after its kind and Spirit after its kind? Um, so some would say we're talking about a, kind of a similar thing. Now you say, okay, Brett, maybe that's a little bit of a stretch, but uh, the spirit moving across waters, life was brought, water in the spirit. Um, but after their kinds, one, one of us is, is, you know, part of us is born of, of the flesh 
That's a whole nother kind than being born of the spirit. Some would argue that. Verse eight is where it gets really interesting. And, and by the way, one of the things that all those previous um, sort of descriptions I just gave you of the possibilities of what this all means, they sort of ignore verse eight. Uh, verse eight, I think if, if, you, if you're saying, for example, um, that it's, the water is just the word, then what does verse eight have to do with it? Because notice verse eight, let's read that again. The wind, Jesus suddenly talks about, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it comes and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. Suddenly we've got those that are born of the spirit, which is being born again, uh, has to do with the wind. Um, in John chapter three, verse eight, this word wind is a notable, and you should probably mark it. Um, it's the word um, pneuma, the word wind, which is also the Greek word for the Holy Spirit. Um, the Hebrew word is ruach, which means wind, breath, or spirit. Um, and so in verse eight, there's kind of a link of the wind and the Holy Spirit and of water. Those three things are all linked together there in verse eight. Um, in the beginning was water, the word and the spirit. See, this is where I tie in the, the, you remember how we were saying, maybe some people say the water is just the word. Well, I believe you can tie the word with the spirit um, because the, God spoke by his word creation into existence. So when the wind moved on the water and, and God said, let there be light and, and, and created the animals, um, the beginning was water, word and spirit all moving together, which gave life. Kind of interesting. Question, when were the disciples truly saved? Like, have you ever thought about that? When, when could you say, well, those disciples, they're, 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 they're full on believers, Christians, uh, born again. When did that happen? Well, there's debate on this. Um, you know, there's a lot of times where they're going along and they still are totally clueless. Uh, and Jesus said, oh, have I been with you so long? You know, when did, the, when did something really happen? I believe, this is my opinion, I'm gonna tell you this, but I, I, I would back it with, you know, John, uh, the gospel of John chapter 20. Remember after Jesus died on the cross, and by the way, salvation really doesn't come except by the cross of Jesus. Now Jesus has died on the cross, risen from the grave, and what are the disciples doing? They're shaking in their sandals, hiding for their lives up in an upper room in Jerusalem. And in John chapter 20, um, Jesus appears to them. Um, and he doesn't say, a bunch of chickens. He doesn't say that. Um, but what does Jesus do? Anybody remember? Breathed. Wind, breath. He breathed on them. And then what did he say? Receive ye the Holy Ghost, he said. The Spirit. Um, emphasis on the word breathe. By the way, the word for breathe, when John 20, 22, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Um, the, the Greek word for breathe there is um, emphusao, where we get our word emphysema, by the way. But emphusao, which means to blow or breathe on. And, and this is when the Spirit, I think, was breathed in them. Do you remember the Holy Spirit relationships? He's with you before you were saved. He's in you when you become a Christian and he'll become upon you. Those prepositions are important. Acts chapter one and two. So the, the, when did the Holy Spirit go in to the disciples? John chapter 20, when Jesus breathed on them and he breathed life on them. Um, when is a person born again? I, I believe when a person repents and, and accepts Jesus as their savior and believes that he died on the cross for their sins and rose from the grave. I believe that's when the Holy Spirit is in a person when they accept Jesus Christ and they're saved. Um, this is why I, I kind of believe this, even though it's kind of a long exhaustive discussion um, saying, I think the spirit is, the water is the spirit. Um, there's a reason why I believe that. And it has a lot to do with Genesis 1-1 and then the whole story of the disciples. Um, this is what makes you born again. I, born again is you have the power of the spirit in you. Anything that's of the flesh is of the flesh and anything of the spirit is of the spirit. Okay, does that all make sense? So you can choose which one you want to uh, uh, sort of choose. But I think all of those basic ones, uh, maybe with the exception of you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Uh, the other four, I think I can, I can see truth in those things and, and basically the right thing. I think I would watch out for that sort of legalistic thing. You gotta go to the water and be baptized or else you're not even going to heaven. It doesn't line up with the rest of scripture. Now, um, this is where we pick it up in verse nine. Nicodemus uh, answered um, and said unto him, how could these things be? 
And Jesus answered and said to him, art thou a master of Israel, teacher of Israel, and knowest not these things? Uh, this, this cracks me up. You know, you're, are you a teacher in Israel? Um, by the way, uh, this better translation in verse 10, something to note, is the original says, art, art thou the teacher in Israel? Uh, Jesus is saying, you're the head honcho teacher is kind of the idea, which is kind of interesting. Now you might say, Pastor Brett, how, do, how should Nicodemus know these things? Um, this, is, this is the New Testament we're reading. We have the advantage of the New Testament. Um, I, I, you know, Jesus is bringing only the Old Testament, the law, the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, Old Testament scripture. Um, you say, well, how could Nicodemus have known this stuff? Jesus is marveling. How are you a teacher and you don't even know this? about being born again. My answer to that first and foremost would be Genesis 1.1. Um, that's why I think Nicodemus should have known this had he been maybe a little more careful in understanding what it meant to have life by the Holy Spirit. And, that, and there's all kinds of examples of that in the Old Testament. I already gave you Genesis 1.1. Um, you wanna have another one that's really great about the life that comes by the Spirit? Uh, in fact, why don't you flip over to Ezekiel chapter 36. Go to the Old Testament, Ezekiel 36. Um, this is really cool. Uh, Ezekiel 36, verse 26. Um, this is all talking about something Nicodemus should have known. Ezekiel 36, 26. And there it says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. What a promise. This promise is foretelling when the Holy Spirit would be put within the hearts of the people. Um, I believe this is foreshadowing, telling of what Jesus is talking about, being born of the Spirit when you get a new heart. Since we're in Ezekiel, let's go to another one. Turn the page to Ezekiel 37. Did you ever hear about the story of the uh, Valley of Dry Bones? Look at Ezekiel 37, uh, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. That's death and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were many, many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh Lord God, thou knowest. And he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say to them, oh ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath. Guess what Hebrew word that is? Ruach, that, that same word we just talked about, breathing, to, uh, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live and I will lay sinew upon you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and I, as I prophesied, there was a noise. Clinkity clink. <laughs> Behold, a shaking and the bones came together, bone to his bone. You know, the knee bone was connected to the thigh bone. And stuff like that. Well, um, look at verse eight. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews of the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. They're just like zombies. They're dead, but they look like people and they're alive. That's the average person today walking around, especially downtown Portland, but uh, sad to say, but no life in them. That's, that's the world that's unsaved. They don't have spiritual life. Um, by the way, this is, this is very specifically talking about the Jews and the Jewish nation. I just kind of make that real clear. Although there's things that are true about us as well. This is about what God's gonna do to the nation of Jews. And people say, well, Brett, you believe the Jews were gathered by God in Israel, but they're not even saved. They don't even believe in Jesus. This is where the Jews are at right now. They're sort of the walking zombie phase. The Lord's brought the Jews back together. Has, has, uh, the signs of life are upon them. But when... When will the Jews have life really breathed into them? During the tribulation, middle part of the tribulation, the abomination of desolation, they'll realize they've been duped and they'll realize Jesus is the Messiah. Romans eleven twenty five, and all of Israel shall be saved at that moment. This is a talking about that. 
But this is what Nicodemus should have known about. There was no breath in them. Then verse nine, he went and said, prophesy to the wind, um, ruach or spirit there. Prophesy son of man and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. <laughs> what a powerful prophecy the Valley of Dry Bones is for the Jewish people. But this is descriptive of really the, the thing the Lord did even with Gentiles. We were born dead with skin on, if you would. And then we were spiritually born again when we had the Holy Spirit. You must be born of, the, of water and of the Spirit. Um, uh, and this is all part of this discussion. So um, Ezekiel 30, uh, 37, uh, this is all pretty powerful stuff. Um, now, back to John chapter three. We gotta hurry as the night is getting late and I told you I'd end early this week. Uh, <laughs> boy, we gotta move. Uh, so John chapter three, where were we? Verse 11. Verily, verily, verse 11, which means true, like it's an emphasis of this is really true, this is really true. That's what it's saying. So I, think, I think you New American standard people, truly, truly, I say to you, uh, something like that. I like the, the poetic value of verily. Verily, verily, I say unto you, um, we speak that we, do not, uh, that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness, verse 11. Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Um, if, you can, if you can't get the basics of earthly stuff, how are you gonna understand the more complex stuff of spiritual nature? Like, you know, this being born of the spirit. Jesus is saying, you gotta kind of open your mind a little bit here to this stuff um, and, and more complex things. And that's where we start talking about the, whole, the Trinity and the glorification of Jesus and other most noteworthy things. Verse 13, it says, and no man hath ascended uh, up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. So Jesus is the only one that came down from heaven to show the truth. Um, uh, now, example of all uh, of life being brought from the son, S-O-N, is verse 14. Um, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. So we're still talking about the same spiritual life that we were just referencing. Um, but we covered this in the second point of last weekend, the must of the savior. He must have had been lifted up on the cross. And why a serpent? He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we may be made the righteousness of God. Now for the most famous verse in the Bible. Um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Um, why is this verse used so much? Why do people memorize it and put it up at NFL games and stuff like that? Um, I, I think it's, it's sort of the verse of the Bible that in, in the most simple of terms summarizes everything perfectly. The most glorious truth is all summed up in one verse. Uh, the center word of the verse is the word son. I love that. Christ is the son, uh, you know. And, and another great word is everlasting. The word everlasting is the, is the word aionius, uh, which is uh, eternal, forever, without end. Um, I love the, the everlasting word. Another, another word, life, um, it's a noun, uh, which, uh, uh, which means uh, life, a state of vitality, uh, every living soul. Um, and when you combine all this together, um, eternal life begins at the moment of faith. When you, when you have faith and you believe, you'll have everlasting life. Uh, not just when you go to heaven, but um, even right now we have life and life more abundantly, the Bible says, Jesus came for that. Uh, more Greek words from this verse, not to overdo it, but the word world, for God so loved the world. Um, interesting word that you should know is the word cosmos. Um, an apt and harmonious arrangement, order out of chaos is this word from the Greek. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the root etymology is the word cosmetic. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's funny how, you know, how ladies say, oh, she's really put together. I heard that term the other day. I was like, what does that mean? And I had to explain to me, uh, you look really put together. Well, that's the word cosmetic. And uh, it's the word, uh, you, know, you know, what is normally in a state of chaos, if you look in the mirror, 
Um, it's you putting things together. That's this word cosmos. Uh, and that's what the Lord does. He takes chaos and puts order to it, um, which is great. Um, by the way, you know, the world is under judgment uh, and wrath. Uh, and, and Jesus has overcome the world. That's what John 3, 16 is all about. For God, the greatest being. Um, so, so, the greatest degree, loved, the greatest affection, the world, the greatest object of his love, that he gave the greatest act, his only, his greatest treasure, begotten, the greatest relationship, Son, the greatest gift, that whosoever, the greatest company, believes the greatest trust, which is pistuo, by the way, same word, in him, the greatest object of faith, should not perish the greatest deliverance, but have the greatest assurance, everlasting, the greatest promise, life, the greatest blessing. I think John 3.16 sums up all the greatest things in all the world and all the existence. Uh, that's why this verse is so huge and we love it. Well, moving along, verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Um, that uh, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son. Um, this is just explaining Christianity 101. We're all condemned to death and hell, but if you believe in Jesus, you are not in that category of condemned. Um, and for the believer, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Beautiful Romans passage. Well, again, um, this idea of believed there in verse 18 is the Greek word pistuo. Again, same word. Um, uh, and there's, there's those that will cho just choose not to believe. That's just kind of the way it goes. There was a barber and a minister walking down the road and the barber, who was an atheist, said, Pastor, if God existed and he's all loving, uh, how come all these poor beggars uh, are out here suffering? And the pastor just kind of remained silent and didn't really answer his question. Um, but they came to another guy near a homeless man that was particularly a mess um, with long, dirty, shaggy hair and an unkept beard. Um, the pastor motioned toward the barber and to come closer. He said, how can you call yourself a barber if this man looks like this? And the barber said, well, he hasn't come to my shop to get cleaned up and taken care of. And the pastor said, and so too, if any one of them would come to Christ, he would save them of their sins free of charge. I like that. That's the truth. That's, that's anyone that chooses to come to Christ will be saved. That's what this is saying. Beautiful. Verse 19 and this is the commendation, condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved or correct, uh, uh, you know, discovered. Um, verse 21, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. This should explain to us why people don't like Jesus today, why people use the name of Jesus in vain, why people make jokes and hate Christians. Uh, hatred of Christianity is becoming sort of more and more popularized these days. It's because men love their darkness rather than the light. And men will, will keep going that way. Um, but man, we gotta keep turning on the light switch of Jesus Christ. Um, well, it goes on uh, in verse, um, uh, verse 22. And, and by the way, um, you know, this is where we uh, start to see sort of changes. Um, um, you know, uh, uh, we're going to see Jesus um, going to be baptized. And so we'll change our scenery because now we're at beyond Jordan. Uh, we're going to see here in verse 26. So we're changing the scenery just a smidgen here. Um, but let's read on verse 22. Um, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anan near Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized for John was not yet cast into prison. Why were they baptizing there? Because there's water there. Why do we baptize in the Willamette River? Because there's water there. Um, verse 25 
Then uh, there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came to John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. And John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. What's John saying here? Um, they're, they're baptizing people in water. John's disciples, they're saying, hey, we have a problem. All the people that used to come to you are now following Jesus. And uh, they're wondering, is he jealous? Was he wounded? Was his pride hurt? Um, but basically he says, uh, you know, he says, man, you know, if, if, if any, anything is given to a man, it comes from heaven. He's basically saying everything Jesus is came from heaven. And then he's gonna clarify what he's talking about in verse 28. He said, you yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. This is the context of our, our third must of last weekend. Um, he must increase, but I decrease. Um, the context is John's you know, disciples saying, man, what do you think about Jesus's popularity? And he said, man, don't you understand when you're at a wedding? When the bridegroom comes in, it's the best man who's standing there excited because it's just, you know, the bridegroom's here. Um, but he said, I'm not the bridegroom. Uh, I'm just, I'm just a part of the, one of the groomsmen or the best man. Um, and when the bride and the bridegroom are brought together, mission accomplished. That's what John the Baptist is saying, uh, which is really cool. By the way, in a Jewish wedding, the best man's job is to invite everybody to the wedding and escort the couple to the wedding chamber and make sure they get there. Uh, that's kind of John the Baptist. He was like the best man in the wedding. Well, verse 30, we're almost done. Uh, um, is, is the one about, uh, you know, the, the must, number three. Uh, he must increase, but I must decrease. Verse 31, he that uh, cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earth, earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard that he testifieth and no man receives his testimony. Um, he that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. Uh, some will not receive it, but those that do, the seal is set is what John the Baptist is saying. I'm reminded of what Paul said, you know, uh, when God says something, it's true and you can bank on it. Romans chapter three, verse four, Paul said, let God be true and every man a liar. In other words, if people say what God says in his word is not right, they're a liar. And that's what John the Baptist is saying. If it's contrary to the Bible, it's not true. Uh, watch out for Discovery Channel, History Channel, college professors, some of the sem seminaries out there, podcasts. When they say something that's not true in the Bible, you can say, let God be true and every man a liar. Um, well, all that to say, verse 34, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. Interesting little verse there. There's no limit to the measure which the spirit will be poured into your life. Um, uh, there is a scripture that warns us about not quenching. Do not quench the spirit. Um, but I wonder how much of us quench the spirit when the Lord has, wants to pour his spirit upon us. In the last days, the Lord's gonna pour out his spirit even to greater measure. That's something I think we should all be excited about. Um, but there's no measure uh, for that person of what the spirit can do. Verse 35, the father loveth the son and hath given him all things into his hand. He that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not on the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John chapter three, this is where uh, people get it wrong when they, people say there's many paths that lead to heaven. Um, and, and again, our essential doctrine list, uh, this is one of the essential doctrines that Jesus Christ, salvation is through him only. And John chapter three supports that. Uh, there's only one through which you can be saved, that's Jesus. Well, we'll pick up chapter four, Lord willing, next week. Let's pray together. Lord, how thankful we are for your word. It's living, it's powerful. And uh, we pray that you would help us to really think through all this and be uh, versed on these verses. Lord, to know what your word teaches concerning life 
eternal life and salvation, these most important topics. Give us understanding and application in Jesus' name. Amen.